Amen. Wasn't that beautiful? This morning we are continuing with the study on one of our fundamental beliefs, which is the spirit of prophecy. And we believe at the Seventh Avenue Church that God pours out his gifts in his church. And one of those gifts is the spirit of prophecy. And this is our third message on that topic. We looked primarily beginning on how God would use prophets in the Old Testament and would raise a prophet to give them a, a message to warn the people and how he did that throughout history and we went all the way to 1844 and believe that God raised up Ellen G. White as well as a prophet for his church and last week we saw we looked a little bit at Ellen White more of a mother and a wife and we saw her writings her counsels to her children uh, her the, the the letters between her and her husbands and we see the struggles of a regular human being who struggled and suffered from two deaths in her family her her two children and and other things as well and one thing that I invited the congregation last Sabbath was to invite anyone who has a concern, a question, or a doubt on the writings of Ellen White just to write it on a, on a card and, and to give it at the end. And I received one. And that one, uh, by the grace of God, we will do our best to answer it from Scripture today. And that one question or concern was, why did Ellen White copy other sources? And so today I want to address the issue of Ellen White and those that criticize her and the critics. Ellen G. White and the accusations against her. Are they valid or are they not valid? And if they are valid, the scripture should, should support a defense for its own prophets. So let's, let's begin with, a, with another word of prayer. Father in heaven, as we open your word, as we open this topic, I ask that you pour out again your Holy Spirit into every single one of us here. And that your word may not just stay written in our, in, our, in our Bible, but may penetrate our hearts and our minds. Please take away any distractions that may, that may interrupt. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So when you study the life of the prophet, can we get the screen ready? When you study the life of the prophet, we see that no prophet really volunteered to be a prophet. <laughs> in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, God would choose who his prophets were. God chose who he would choose to be a prophet. And so, the reason why nobody would volunteer to be a prophet is because prophets while they were alive, were ridiculed, and when they were dead, they were insulted and bad mouth. They were always talking against them, bringing accusations against them, persecuting them. And people don't, don't like prophets or what they have to say, not because the prophet is against the people, but because they don't like the message that the prophet has to say from God. And so prophets suffered many afflictions and persecutions. And that is the life. I want to welcome you to the world of Ellen G. White. And she knew, she knew of the accusations that were brought against her. She knew of the allegations of, of the critics. And she writes about it 
She writes about it in Selected Messages, Volume 3, page 350. She says, truth will triumph. I expect these raids will be made against me till Christ comes. And they are being made against her even up to today. And they will be until Christ comes. There is, no, there is not an opposer of our faith, but that makes Mrs. White his text. They begin to oppose the truth and then make a raid of me. What have I done, she asks. Why, I ask, is all this zeal against me? I am watched, every word I write is criticized, every move I make is commented upon. And she concludes by saying, I leave my work and its results until we gather about the great white throne. She knows that people will write against her, not like her, and her question is, why? Why so much hate on, against me? And, and her answer is, I leave it eventually up to who? Up to God. Let God be my judge. Let God be my judge. So does this mean that we can't double check or we can't um, evaluate what she has to say? Absolutely not. We, we can and we should. And she writes again in, in Manuscript Release, Volume 7, page 323. She says, Every charge should be carefully investigated. It should not be left in any uncertain way. The people should not be left to think that it may be or it may not be. The people must not be left to believe a lie. They must be undeceived. They must be undeceived. This sounds like somebody who wants everyone to see the word for themselves, study for themselves, and not just take her word for it. She says, check me out. People should not be deceived. And today we're going to look at the accusations against Ellen White and defend them with Bible truth, with the scripture. And the first accusation I want to address, the most common one, was Ellen White copied from many sources. Ellen White is sometimes called a plagiarist because she copied many sources. So I, wanted, I want you to turn your Bibles to the book of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes. Who wrote the book of Ecclesiastes? Solomon did. He also wrote the book of Proverbs. Is that right? Yes, he did. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 9 and 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 9 and 10. And so we're going to see here that Solomon is talking about himself, but he talks about himself in the third person. And he is, and he is, giving, he is letting us know how God inspired him to write the book of Proverbs. Do we consider the book of Proverbs inspired? Amen. Is it in Scripture? Absolutely. It, it would do us well to read the book of Proverbs every month. A chapter per day. In verse 9, there in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 9, it says, And moreover, because the preacher was wise. Here, the preacher is talking about himself. He still taught the people knowledge. Yes, and he, he pondered and sought out and set in order many proverbs. He wrote the book of Proverbs. So he's there we can see he's talking about himself. That the preacher sought out to set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find acceptable words. And what was written was upright words of truth. In, this, in these two verses, we see the steps for inspiration writing. And we, let's go over them again. If we just understand these two verses, we understand on how God inspired the prophets and how yet the prophets put down or communicated what God inspired to them. And we're going we're gonna to see that the prophets are not God's pen men. God did not tell Moses to write, in the beginning, 
God created the heaven. Oh, okay. You, you, you're not there yet? Okay, I'll wait. It wasn't word for word. So here we see verse 9. Let's look at verse 9 again. And more, moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. The prophets make an effort to teach the people. They want to teach them something. Teach them knowledge. Yes, he pondered and sought out. He sought out. He gathered information. He did his research. He wants to teach the people. He gathers research. He does investigation. And said in order many proverbs, the preacher sought to find, what does the Bible say? Acceptable words. Now he's looking to see what vocabulary he's going to use. Acceptable words. And what was written was upright words of what? Truth. So it's not just any words. They are still filtered by the Holy Spirit, but the words of truth. The words of truth. So here we see that Solomon gives us an example of how he wrote the book of Proverbs. How did he write it? Well, he wanted to teach the people something. We can be taught a lot from the book of Proverbs. He gathered information. We're going to see that he did his research and gathered information. He looked for acceptable words. But yet, eventually, besides ex looking for acceptable words, he needed to make sure that they were, it was truth, that it was what he was writing, that it was truth. If we go to the book of Proverbs, that since we're talking about that, Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1, the book right before. Verse 1. The book of Proverbs is known as a book written by Solomon. It says there, Proverbs 1.1, 1, 1, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. There he's, he's basically saying, these are my Proverbs, and, he be, and then the Proverbs begin, taking credit for the, whole book of, for the whole book of Proverbs. But yet, if we go to Proverbs chapter 30, we see that Solomon got a proverb from someone else. He did his research, and gathered other sources. In Proverbs chapter 30, verse 1, it says, The words of who? Solomon? No. Of Agur, the son of Jacketh. And, and chapter 30 continues on. So here we see that Proverbs chapter 30 is not necessarily the words of Solomon. But yet Solomon includes it in his Proverbs. We see that also in Proverbs 31. Proverbs, 30, Proverbs 31. The words of King Lemuel, the utterance which his mother taught him. And he begins the, there in Proverbs 31. So we see here that Solomon had an effort to teach the people. He gathered his research and here he gathers some from this king he gathers some from agur and he includes it in his book of proverbs besides gathering information he finds acceptable acceptable words what to what to put but yet they have to be words of truth words of truth and we even see this same example from john the Bat I'm, I'm sorry from john the apostle from John the Apostle. John borrowed, if we go to the book of Revelation, chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. I don't know how many are familiar with the Apocrypha, which are a collection of books that are considered not inspired. But, they, but some Bibles consider them inspired and are in there, but... But when you compare the Apocrypha with the rest of Scripture, it doesn't match. A lot of things in the Apocrypha are fishy and doesn't consist with the rest of Scripture. So Christianity as a whole says these books are not inspired. They may be good light reading, but they're not inspired. And the same can be, found, uh, can be said about the Pseudepigrapha, which are similar to the Apocrypha. And these were written a hundred years before John wrote the book of Revelation. And yet, 
in the Pseudepigrapha, there is a book called the Book of Enoch. And in that Book of Enoch, chapter 40, verse 1, Notice what, what this writer says. It says, After that I saw a multitude beyond numbers and reckoning who stood before the Lord of the spirits. That sounds very similar to what John writes in Revelation 7, verse 9. And after these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number standing before the throne. Do they sound very similar? Could we say that maybe John borrowed some of the language or, or, or some of the concept that he read there in Enoch and yet he puts it in his epistle, in the book of Revelation. Again, remembering the four steps of how inspiration works. They want to teach something, they gather their information, they do their homework, they look for acceptable words and they communicate truth. Another, another example is in, in that same book of uh, 1 Enoch 86.1, notice how close this one is. It says, and I saw and behold a star fell from heaven. How does John describe Lucifer's fall in Revelation 9.1? And I saw a star falling from heaven. Very, very similar, if not copying we could say and this is exactly what Luke did if we go to the book of Luke turn to the book of Luke I, I would want to show several examples where these Bible writers wrote their Gospels or, or wrote what God inspired them Luke chapter 1 Luke tells us how he wrote the book of Luke and when we read verses 1 through 4, we're going to see that he basically gathered testimonies from other people and put together the book of Luke. Luke chapter 1, verse 1, 1 through 4, the Bible says, Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, delivered them to us. It seemed good for me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first to write to you an orderly account. So here we see Luke telling us that other people were writing from the testimony of others and it seemed good for me to also do it and give an orderly account from their testimonies. This is what Luke did, this is what Solomon did, what John did, and, and even Matthew. Matthew and Luke borrow a lot from Mark. Borrow a lot from Mark. So what we call John, Luke, or Solomon a plagiarist, do they copy from each other? Are their writings considered not inspired anymore? <laughs> I don't think so. But you see, Ellen White does the same thing and critics rise up right away. Rise up right away. And like Solomon and John, she used other sources to describe what God had shown her. How was it that Solomon said there in Ecclesiastics, they have, they have an effort to teach the people. They gather together resources. They, they study. They, they find acceptable words. They, they look for the right vocabulary words to use. And, but yet, they communicate truth. They communicate truth. And we at Seventh-day Adventists believe that that is how it worked with Ellen G. White. She experienced divine inspiration in the same manner, in the same degree, as the Bible writers. As I have reviewed Ellen White's ministry, what I am amazed is not what she borrowed, but what I am amazed is what she left out. That's what I am amazed. Not so much of what she borrowed, but what she left out. How did John know what to leave out from the book of Enoch? 
How did Luke know what to leave out when he was hearing the testimonies from different people? Or Matthew? Or Solomon? When he would maybe heard or read the, from the Proverbs of Agur? How did he know what to leave out and what, and what to keep? The only way is that they were coached by the Holy Spirit. And that's why the Bible says all scripture is inspired by God. All scripture is inspired by God. God, the Holy Spirit, was guiding them in what to keep, what not to keep. And they were gathering information, finding the right vocabulary, the right words, but yet it was communicating truth. It was communicating truth. And, and the problems with the critics is that they may have, is, is that they have an uninformed and unbiblical understanding of inspiration. It's not that God tells them word for word what to write. Another problem that critics have with the writings of Ellen G. White is that she really interrupts your sinful lifestyle. She really interrupts your sinful lifestyle. And we'll get back to that in a little bit. But another accusation against, against the spirit of prophecy is that Ellen White is a woman and that women can be, can be prophets. Turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter, chapter 2. And while you're looking for Acts, chapter 2, I'll remind you that Moses' sister, Miriam, was a prophetess. We can see that in Numbers, chapter 12. Deborah was a prophetess in Judges, chapter 4. Anna was a prophetess in Luke, chapter 2. And so in, in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, verse 16. Peter here is preaching. Acts 2. And he quotes Joel. What, we, what was the scripture reading? He quotes him. In verse 17. And it shall come to pass in the last days. But you see here, Peter adds in the last days. Joel didn't say in the last days. But Peter is living much later than Joel did. So here he's saying, In the last days, that I will pour out my spirits on all flesh, your sons and your daughters shall what? Prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my maidservants and on my maidservants, on my maidservants and on my, I'm sorry, on my men servants and on my maidservants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy in what days in the last days in the last days so can, should we be expecting the prophets in the last days peter here is telling us there will be both men or women as well so that accusation doesn't stand another accusation is that she is not in the bible so so, so she can be counted as inspiration. Turn with me to the book of First Chronicles. First Chronicles, there are many prophets that are not in the Bible, but yet they are still considered inspired prophets. First Chronicles chapter 29. First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 29. And it says here, Now the acts of King David, first and last, indeed were written in the book of Samuel the seer. And we can, and, and we can see that, right, in First and Second Samuel, the life of King David. But notice, you remember how we talked about who the seers are? In the first Sabbath, we talked about the spirit of prophecy. Who are the seers? The prophets. Okay, so we can see about David's life from the book of Samuel the seer in the book of who else? Nathan the prophet and in the book of Gad the seer. Now is Nathan in the canon of the Bible? The book of Nathan? 
No. Does that mean he wasn't a prophet of God? No, it doesn't. If we look also just in there, in, go to now to the Second Chronicles chapter 9. Second Chronicles chapter 9 verse 29 is the book right next. It says, Now the rest of the Acts of Solomon, first and last, they are written in the book of Nathan the prophet. In the prophecy of Ahijah the Shilonite, and in the vision of Edo the seer concerning Jeroboam the son of Nabet. Nebat, sorry. So here we see again Nathan, the book of Nathan, and yet it's not in the canon of scripture that we have. But yet we believe that Nathan was a true prophet of God. Amen. So even though you may not be in the canon, in the scriptures, in the Bible, Nathan still had authority, plenty of authority. And even though Ellen White is not in the Bible, she has authority, plenty of authority. Can you imagine if, if, you, were, if you were David? You remember the story of David there where his, his sin with Bathsheba, he committed adultery and he murdered. All because he wanted somebody else's wife for himself. And Nathan finds out by God. So he goes and tells him a parable. You can, you can, you can see this in 2 Samuel chapter 12. If you just join me there, 2 Samuel chapter 12, Nathan reveals to David his sin. And there he gives them a parable. Instead of coming to David and say, you murderer, what are you doing? You adulterer. No, he tells him a parable. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 1 says, Then the Lord sent Nathan to David. God sent him. And he came to him and said to him, And here's the parable. There were two men in one city, one rich and one poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little lamb which he had bought and nourished. And it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom. And it was like a daughter to him. Okay, are you getting the picture? The poor man had this lamb. It was just basically their pet. They loved it so much. It ate, it, it ate from the same table. And then verse 4 says, a traveler, came to the, a traveler came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Are you seeing here the, the story? A rich man says, you know, I need to offer a meal. I don't want to use my animal. Let me go take this poor, this poor man's only lamb and use it. And what is David's response in verse 5? So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man and said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. And he, and he shall restore four foes for the lamb because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Then here speaks the prophet of God. Then Nathan said to David, you are that man. And he begins to describe, you are king of Israel. You have access to all the single women can be yours at your disposal. You can marry whoever you want, but you took somebody else's wife, their only wife, that wasn't for you. Do you think that Nathan had authority then? Or did David say, well, you know, Moses' writing doesn't tell me anything about that. No. Nathan, David fell down on his knees and the Psalms is written of his repentance of his repentance because of Nathan's 
message. Nathan was a non-canonical prophet, but had plenty of spiritual authority. Has plenty of spiritual authority. Who would David have been rejecting if he would have, re if he would have rejected Nathan's message? God. Let's assume that you are living in the days of Jeremiah and Jeremiah is preaching and saying we need to repent if not the Babylonians are going to come and, and conquer us. To reject Jeremiah in his days would be rejecting God. Or living in the days of John the Baptist and John the Baptist is preparing the way for Jesus and we reject John the Baptist. To reject John the Baptist would be to reject God. Would be to reject God. To reject the prophet in his or her time is to reject God. Is to reject God. Ellen White is not in the Bible, but she points us to the Bible and has authority as the Bible does. You see, many people don't like her because she interrupts our lifestyle. She, t she tells us that we need to remove sin. We need to stop sinning. We need to focus more on Jesus. The Bible tells us the exact same thing, friends. But she is even more nailed down to the point. When she talks about health reform, I know that steps on my toes and your toes too. <laughs> when she talks about dress reform, she steps, she steps on all of our toes. But it is all because she wants to point us back to God. Yes. Points us back to God. And all those things draw us away from God. Draw us away from God. She is not in the Bible, but has as much authority as the Bible writers. Because the same, the same Holy Spirit that inspired Nathan that inspired Jeremiah, Moses, John the Baptist, is the same Holy Spirit that lives today. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. And it's the same Holy Spirit that inspired Ellen G. White. And in Christ's object lessons here is just another reference of how we need to turn back to God. She writes, the Bible is to be presented as the word of the infinite God, as the end of all controversy and the foundation of all faith. If, you, if you've noticed, you will never find in her writings promoting herself. Every true prophet will never promote themselves, but lead people back to repentance and back to God. Let the word of God speak to the people. Let those who have heard only traditions and human theories and, and maxims hear the voice of him whose words can renew the soul unto everlasting life. She's pointing you straight to Jesus Christ. Straight to Jesus Christ. And if her writings step on our toes, it is because we, are, we may be living outside the will of God. And God is wanting to come back to him. Wanting for us to come back to him. If we, look, if we turn to our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4, another accusation is that there can't be any prophets after Bible writers. And in Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to see that there are prophets after Bible writers. Besides the fact that we read Acts chapter 2 that in the last days God would raise up prophets. Ephesians 4 verse 7 jump, jump to verse 11. He's talking about the gifts, of, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till, so this is how long God is going to be using, God is going to be pouring out these gifts, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the statutes of the fullness of Christ. And that is until Christ comes again. Until Christ comes again, he's going to use 
the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So in closing, friends, I want to invite you to turn to 2 Kings. 2 Kings, one of my favorite Old Testament stories. 2 Kings. Here, the prophet Elijah is being taken to heaven. And his student, Elisha, is going to continue being the prophet for, for, for the people here on earth. 2 Kings chapter 2. And so Elisha, the student, made, or made a request. He said, Elijah, the first prophet, I know their names are mixed, can, can mix you up. But Elijah asked his student, what would you like for, for me to give you? And his student Elijah said, I want a double portion that you have. And Elijah said, that's a hard thing you ask. But if you see me leave, then you will get it. And so Elijah, I'm sorry, Elisha never left his sight of Elijah because he didn't know when God was going to take him. Eventually, God took him in a fiery chariot. He threw his mantle. Elisha picked it up. And so there now Elisha is a prophet. And Elisha has a double portion of the Holy Spirit. Elisha does more miracles than even Elijah did. And if we look in verse 19, it's the first miracle that he does. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 19. It says, Then the man, the men of the city said to Elisha, Please notice the situation of the city is, is pleasant as my Lord sees, but the water is bad and the ground barren. Okay, so the water, I guess, it wasn't drinkable and the, and the ground wouldn't produce. And he said, bring me a new bowl and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. Then he went out to the source of the water and cast in the, in the salt there and said, Thus says the Lord, I have healed the waters from it. There shall be no more death or barren. So the waters remain healed to this day according to the word of Elisha, which he spoke. That's his first miracle. Notice verse 23. Then he went up from there to Bethel. And as he was going up on the road, some youth, some young people, came from the city and mocked him, saying to him, Go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. Okay, obviously he was bald. And they're, and they're making fun of him. They're teasing him. Calling him names. And verse 24. So he, who is he? Elisha. The prophet of God. These are strong words and it may even bother us sometimes. Turned around and looked at them and pronounced a curse on them in the name of the Lord. And two female bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the youth. Have mercy. Thank you. Amen. Some of the youth came up from the city and mocked him. And called him Baldy. So he turned around and looked at them and pronounced a curse on them in the name of the Lord. And two bears came and killed 42 of the youth. Wow. Wow. Was there a message that Elijah, Elisha, was trying to get across? Was there a message that God was trying to get across? Notice, it says, it says, pronounce a curse on them in the name of the Lord. Somehow God communicated to Elisha and says, this cannot happen. You are my servant. And no one is going to make fun of you like that. Maybe Elijah would have said, well, maybe he would have thought, that's kind of strong, Lord. But a prophet does what the Lord tells you to do. The message is, friends, you do not mess with God's prophets. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Amen. And she writes about it here in early writings about this story. She says, the wicked youth who had learned from their who? Parents. Where did they get the idea of making fun of, God, of God's prophets? The parents. Let's be careful about how we talk about our prophet and our pastors in front of our children. Amen. Amen. I'm not talking about myself, only all pastors. <laughs> Conference presidents. Hmm. The wicked youth who had learned from their parents to despise a man of God followed Elisha and mocking him, crying up, crying, go up, thou bald head, go up, the bald head. And thus insulting his servant, they insulted God and met their punishment then and there. In Prophets and Kings, page 236, this is talking about this same story. Had Elijah allowed the mockery to pass unnoticed, okay, if he would have just like, oh, silly kids, if he would have just ig ignored it, he would have continued, he would have continued to be ridiculed. And his mission to instruct and save in a time of grave, of grave nation peril might have been defeated. This one instant of terrible severity was sufficient to command respect throughout his life. Even kindness should have its limits. Amen. We are to be kind, but not to be trampled on over and over. Authority must be maintained by firm severity or it will be received by many with mockery and contempt. So this had to happen in order for his mission to continue working. God wanted to send the message, and they got it. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, and correction. Here, God is correcting us. If we downplay a prophet, if we downplay his servants, you better watch out. You better not. A prophet of God is to be respected. Is to be respected. Does that mean we can't test the prophets? No, we should test the prophets. Absolutely. And I want to just give resources for doing your homework more. You can go to ellenwhiteanswers.org where many, of, many accusations are played against her. There is an answer there in that website. You can also go to whiteestate.org or if you have a smartphone, you can download the apps, e.g. White Writings or e.g. White Answers, giving a defense for the spirits of prophecy. And I just want to apologize for those of you who have been abused the wrong way by the, the spirit of prophecy. You see, it's like drinking water. And I know I've used this illustration before, but I'll use it again. Water can be good for what? Question your thirst, all right? Especially summer is coming. You spend outside, oh, a nice cold water just, oh, it feels good. But it can also be used to drown someone. And because people have used water to drown someone, are you going to stop drinking water at all? No. Because somebody abused the use of water doesn't mean the water is not good. Friends, I am sorry if somebody has abused the writings of Ellen White and has condemned you by using her writings. 
That does not mean that her writings are not a blessing. That does not mean that her writings cannot bless you and bring you closer to Christ. Closer to Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5.19 says, Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast to what is good. Friends, may God bless you. And as you do your research, investigate, keep in mind on how God inspires his prophets. They teach. They have an effort to teach. They gather their resources. They find acceptable words. But yet, they communicate truth. It is still filtered by the Holy Spirit. It is still filtered by the Holy Spirit. So with this in mind, I want to invite you. I know last week I gave Steps to Christ. If you have not read Ellen White at all, I invite you to begin reading the classic Steps to Christ. And I promise you, I promise you, you will fall in love more with Jesus. And you will start reading your Bible again, or more often. Because a prophet of God takes you back to the Word of God. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much, oh God, because you are merciful to us. And so I just ask you, Lord, that you be with everyone here. And those who may have been abused by the writings of Ellen White, I ask that you help them in their heart to not shun her away because somebody misused her. For you can misuse the Bible as well. But I ask you, Lord, that you take every single one of us here and that we may read her writings to draw closer to you. Thank you for not, abandoning, for not leaving us and abandoning us but sending your prophets to prepare us for your soon coming. And now, Lord, bless this congregation and bless especially the visitors with us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.